Hi, my name is Ben Schaefer. Welcome to night number two of the Preacher Feature Debate. We're so grateful that you have decided to join us tonight, and you are in for a real treat. We're going to have Todd Clippard and Tanner Dyken discussing this proposition. The Bible affirms that immersion in water on the part of the believer is necessary for salvation. Todd is going to argue the affirmative in that, and Tanner is going to deny that proposition. I'm going to turn it over to, to Todd, and he's going to explain some things about the, the debate format that him and Tanner have agreed upon. And once he's done going over those introductory matters, he's going to jump right in to his first proposition or his first affirmation. We hope that you will comment, that you will like, and you will share this debate. There's people around the world who are going to be tuning in tonight. And the more that we like it and the more that we share this video, uh, the more people will have a chance to hear the truth. So with that, we want to thank you again for being here, and I'm going to turn it over to Todd. I'm thankful to be back with you again tonight in the second night of our Bible discussion. I'm thankful to Ben and David for the opportunity to do this and thankful for their hard work. Thankful again to Tanner for his agreement to participate in this discussion. And uh, he and I have continued to correspond even after last night's debate and throughout uh, the course uh, today. And I appreciate his good spirit. Again, I thank uh, Bill Burke, and Tyler Young, and Clint Brown for their invaluable assistance. And thanks to all of you for watching. And most of all, we thank God for this opportunity. I want to explain just a couple of things before we begin relative to the format in this debate. Uh, last night, it just so happened that in my preparations, I had some material that coincided with Tanner's first affirmative speech. Now, I made my opening statements and I went back to my already prepared material, some of which pertain to his first speech. My job in this first affirmative is to attempt to prove the proposition that the immersion of the that immersion of the believer is necessary to receive remission of sins. Tanner's job in his first negative is to disprove the proposition, not disprove my specific points. Since he does not know what I'm going to say, his remarks, just like mine last night, have been prepared without any regard to what I might say in my first affirmative. Thus. He may not specifically address what I say until his second negative speech. He may or may not address what I say in his first, but again, that is not his task. And so I want you to be aware that uh, Tanner may or may not address my specific points, but that's not his job in his first negative. So please, before you comment saying Tanner's not dealing with Todd's scriptures or Todd's arguments, please just listen to what Tanner has to say in his first negative speech before commenting. Now, with that, I want to now begin my first affirmative. The testimony and the pattern of Scripture is that God bestows spiritual blessings only upon those who obey him. And the obedience of faith is the means through which man becomes the recipient of the rewards of God's grace. My affirmative again is that the Bible affirms that immersion of a believer is necessary for salvation. So I'm going to call for slide 125. Now, the manifestation and the administration of God's grace follows the following pattern or, or, or pattern. God's grace provides to man God's law, which we may refer to as conditions of blessing, which man by faith obeys thereby receiving God's reward, which can never, ever be considered as earned or merited. Now, there are some examples of this that we showed last night and we'll show again tonight. Slide 130, please. In Numbers chapter 21, we find the incident of the fiery serpents biting and biting those who grumbled against God and against Moses, and many of them died. But during the course of that incident, that God gave Moses a specific instruction, make a serpent. And he gave the people specific conditions of obedience. Whoever looks, whoever's been bit and looks upon this serpent will be healed. And the Bible says that all those who looked upon the serpent were healed. So they 
through their faith received the reward of God, but in so doing in no way contributed to the work that God did. Slide 131, please. Again, we go to true and false questions. Those bitten by serpents were saved by grace. And that is true. Those bitten were saved by grace, God's grace, apart from any works of obedience. And that, of course, is false. Then the next question is their obedience invalidated God's grace and sovereignty. And of course, that is also false. Now we ask this question, could God, could God have chosen to save those who were bitten without any response of faith? He could. Is it reasonable to say that God exercised his sovereignty by calling on Moses to make the serpent and for those who were bitten to look upon it? It is absolutely reasonable to say that God was exercising his sovereignty here. And then the last question in regard to this is, did Moses or those bitten add anything to the power or work of God? And of course, the answer to that is no, they did not. Now, if you would, uh, slide 140, please. Ben, we'll go quickly through the incident of the fall of Jericho, where grace was extended. I have given you the city, Joshua 6 and verse 2. The grace of God is extended. Then there is the law of God, that is the conditions of obedience that were required of the Israelites to march around the city and the associated instructions with marching around the city. Then we have in verses uh, 14 through 20, the people obeyed God. They accepted God's conditions of blessing. They obeyed God and received the reward of God in verses 20 and 21, that the walls fell down flat and they overtook the city. They conquered it. And in Hebrews 11 and verse 30, it says, by faith, the walls of Jericho fell after they were encompassed for seven days. And so we see, again, God's grace is in no way negated by attaching conditions to uh, his promise of blessing. And we'll ask a similar line of questions in regard to in regard to this incident. Could God have chosen to flatten the wall of Jericho without Israel's obedience? The answer is yes, he could. Could he have chosen instead to rain fire and brimstone on them as he did Sodom and Gomorrah? and the cities of the plain in Genesis 19. Yes, he could. Could he have dropped hailstones on Jericho and its inhabitants like he did on Adonizedek and his alliance in Joshua chapter 10? Yes, he could. And finally, could he have chosen to defeat Jericho without any assistance, so to speak, without any act of faith or obedience of any kind on the part of Israel as he did when he defeated Ammon, Moab, and Seir in Second Chronicles chapter 20 and answer, yes, he could, because he did all these things previous. He could have done those exact same things. Well, not previous in Second Chronicles, but he had done all these things uh, by his power, by his authority, by his grace, by his mercy. But he chose to do differently with regard to Jericho. He gave specific conditions of obedience. And when Israel obeyed Israel, was blessed. We could note other examples. For example, in 2 Kings 5, Naaman was healed of his leprosy, but not until after he obeyed the command of God to go and dip seven times in the Jordan River. He dipped and then he was cleansed. We can note the blind man of John chapter 9, when Jesus made the mud and put it on his eyes, he said, go and wash in the pool of Siloam. And he went he washed and he received his sight. And that was exactly what he reported to those who asked him what had happened. He said, a man named Jesus anointed my eyes with clay. I went, I washed, I received my sight. Now, does anybody think that that man believed he contributed to the work of Jesus by going and washing his eyes in the pool of Siloam? Do you think that he thought or that he said to anyone that he contributed that oh, Jesus didn't do it all. I did I did my part after Jesus did his part. Well, that is just as, as silly as can be. And we know that that man knew that Jesus healed him because that's what that man said. And so 
we ask, ask this question with regard to with regard to those bitten, with regard to Israel and Joshua six, with regard to Naaman, with regard to the blind man. Did God require obedience of them to bless them? Yes. Did their obedience add anything to God's power or show God's power or work to be in any way deficient or insufficient? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. All right, Ben, if you will, please bring me slide number 150. As we have seen that God has extended his grace through and attaching conditions of obedience that man obeys in order to receive those blessings, so it is also with the gospel and God's plan of salvation. In Titus chapter 2, beginning of verse 11, the Bible says, Now the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, godly in this present age. And so we see the grace of God is extended to all men and that that grace teaches us. Well, what does it teach us? It teaches us God's law. It teaches us God's conditions of blessing. For example, in John 8, 24, what says, or Jesus said, except you believe that I am, you will die in your sin. Or it says in Acts 17, 30 and 31 that uh, that God commands all men everywhere to repent because he's appointed a day in which he'll judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he's ordained and give assurance unto all that he's raised him from the dead. That God commands that we confess Jesus before men, Matthew 10 and verse 32. We must confess him as Lord, Romans 10, verses 9 and 10. For confession is made unto salvation, not after salvation. Mark 16, 15, and 16, Jesus gave this condition. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. And it's not given as an imperative. It's just given as a declarative statement. Jesus said, who's the man that's going to be saved? The man who believes the gospel and is baptized. And then God says we must also remain faithful. That we must walk in the light as he is in the light and have fellowship with one another to have the cleansing power of the blood of Christ on us continually. First John 1 and verse number 7. Then man, when he accepts through faith God's conditions of blessing, he obeys God. He obeys the word of God. As Jesus said, not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my father who is in heaven. Matthew 7 and verse 21. And then having accepted God's conditions of blessing, having obeyed the commands of God and accepted his conditions, faithfully obeying them, the reward, as we can see in Mark 16, 16, is the reward is salvation. Uh, Hebrews 5 and verse 9, he's the author of eternal salvation to all them that obey him. All right, uh, Ben, if you will bring me now slide number 210. Let's take a look for a moment at uh, Mark chapter 16. I've mentioned this passage a couple of times already. In Mark 16 and verse 16, we have here on slide 210 a a, a diagram of this sentence, which helps us to understand the construction of the sentence and its ultimate meaning. And so as we as we look at, at this, we see that there are two different independent clauses here. And we're going to focus on the one on top, that he will be saved who believes and is baptized. Slide 211, please, Ben. Again, this verse is composed of two independent clauses. And the construction of the second clause in no way negates the force of the first. Many people in trying to, to quibble over the force of what Jesus said in the first part of Mark 16, 16, say that, well, he didn't mention anything about baptism in the second half. So really, faith is the only important thing. And that's simply nothing more than the figment of somebody's imagination. Who did Jesus say would be saved? He who believes and is baptized. Slide 212, if you would please, Ben. Again, who believes and is baptized is an adjective clause modifying the one who will be saved. Moreover, you see on, or you, as you did see in the diagram, and is a coordinating conjunction making belief in the gospel and baptism of equal import among those who would be saved. Now, Ben, if you would please bring me slide 320, slide number 320. 
want to briefly examine Acts 2 and verse 38, where Peter, in preaching what is commonly referred to as the first gospel sermon on the day of Pentecost, as he preached about the resurrected Christ, those that heard what he said, said when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so we find in this verse, there are two phrases I want us to consider with regard to Acts 2 and verse 38. First is repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ. What is meant, and Ben, if you can bring up slide 320, if we have difficulty, it's all right. I can walk through it. What is meant by the phrase in the name of? And the phrase in the name of means by the authority of. Uh, we can recall, uh, for example, at least in, I'm old enough to remember my childhood where uh, the, the police would jump out and tell the, tell the bad guy, stop in the name of the law. In other words, I have the authority of the law to command you to stop. And so to do things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ means to do things by his authority. So what kind of what kind of baptism did Jesus authorize? Well, in Matthew 28 and verse 19, again, Ben, if, if slide 321 comes up, that's fine. If not, in Matthew 28 and verse 19, the, the baptism that Jesus authorized is one that makes a person a disciple. Go and make disciples of all the nations. How do you do that? By baptizing them into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. In Mark 16, 16, the baptism that Jesus authorized is a baptism that brings salvation. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. And then in Luke 24, and verse 47, we see where Jesus said that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And Peter preached that exact same thing in Acts 2 and verse 38 when he said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And so we see that baptism in the name of Christ makes one a disciple. It, uh, it saves the individual through the power of God by submitting to it, and it is a baptism that brings the remission of sins. Now, with regard to the phrase for the remission of sins in Acts 2.38, the, the passage there, the word for is oftentimes confused to, by some who say for means because of and not unto or for the purpose of. And that's not the meaning of the word in this particular case. The phrase for the remission of sins means unto the remission of sins. And so we see that that uh, that uh, baptism is before prior to the remission of sins. And so uh, I'm down to five minutes. Let me just add a couple more passages very quickly. In Acts 22 and verse 16, as Paul recounted his own conversion with regard to his incident or his encounter with Ananias, as Ananias spoke to him, he said to Saul, that, that time known as Saul of Tarsus, and now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And so that passage is extremely clear that to be baptized is to wash away one's sins and calling on the name of the Lord is a phrase that describes that act, much like baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in Matthew 28, 19, describes how the disciple is made. In Acts 2, 21, Peter said, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, quoting, uh, quoting Joel chapter two and verse 32. When the people ask, what shall we do? They're asking, what shall we do to be saved? What shall we do to call on the name of the Lord? And Peter's answer in Acts 2 and verse 38, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. In Acts, excuse me, in Romans 10 and verse 13, it says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
And then later in verse 16, Paul says, but they've not all obeyed the gospel. And so we see here that to call on the name of the Lord is the same as obeying the gospel. Those that call on the name of the Lord will be saved. But Paul lamented, they've not all obeyed the gospel. They've not all obeyed the gospel, called on the name of the Lord. And that's exactly what Jesus said with regard to the gospel in Mark 16, 15 and 16, that we obey the gospel by believing the gospel and being baptized in order to be saved. And then finally, we have Romans chapter six and verses three through six and verse uh, and verse also verses 17 and 18. As we prepare to close, do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we also should walk in newness of life. So we walk in newness of life after we have been buried and raised with Christ. In verse 5, it says, For if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. And so we see again, the condition of baptism, if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. And this accords with what we noted last night from verses 17 and 18, but God be thanked that when you were the servants of sin, you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. And so that form of doctrine is found in Romans 6, verses 3 through 6, and really following the, the 7, 8, and 9. But the form is to be buried with Christ in baptism, raised in newness of life, planted together in the likeness of his death, that we might be receive the condition to be in the likeness of his resurrection. When we obey from the heart that form of doctrine, like those Romans, those noble Romans, we shall be then set free from sin. And so with that, uh, my time is expired and I'll turn it back over to Ben at this time. All right. Well, uh, I'd just like to uh, thank you all again for uh, coming on and uh, listening to uh, the debate tonight. Uh, thank you, Todd, for that uh, strong opening statement that you gave, and I'll uh, try to, uh, I'll try to uh, give my own. Uh, as uh, uh, Todd had said at the beginning, usually how debate uh, is done is that the affirmative will go first, they will comment on the affirmation, and then the negative will go and also comment on the affirmation. And so that's what uh, I'd like to do for the most part with my time tonight. Uh, so, uh, without any uh, you know, further delay, uh, tonight uh, I'll be giving the uh, positive, uh, a positive uh, accounting in Scripture of what baptism is. And from that, I hope that we see that baptism is not uh, uh, placed as being the occasion of our salvation. The reason that God saves us is not because we were baptized. Uh, this discussion tonight is not whether baptism represents how we are saved, that is, how Christ died and rose on our behalf. Neither is this a discussion over whether God works to spiritually benefit his people in baptism. Rather, this is about whether the physical act of being baptized confirms, uh, confers any necessary saving grace. And I'll uh, also say uh, that this is discussion is not about whether the typical experience in the scripture uh, is that a person exercises saving faith at the time of their baptism. The real discussion is whether or not baptism, by the virtue of its act, uh, is the, uh, the reason why we are placed in a saving relationship to Jesus Christ. Uh, of course, I will be denying this, and I'll do so by uh, five contentions. Uh, but first, uh, a good distinction in the scripture that, that we should have in mind as we go into this is the distinction that's made in the scripture between symbols and the substance of what those symbols 
signify. Uh, one a good way that we can see this distinction in Scripture is by way of looking at circumcision. A circumcision was often used in Scripture uh, as a picture, as a symbol of God's saving work towards his people, uh, how he called Israel to be separate from the nations, uh, even how he uh, removed sin from them. Uh, in Genesis 17, verse 10, This is my covenant, which ye shall keep, between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised, and ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. In Jeremiah 4, verse 4, Circumcise yourselves to the Lord, and take away the foreskin of your heart, ye men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my fury come forth like fire and burn that none can quench it because of the evil of your doing. So we see in the first case uh, that it is given as a symbol of the covenant relationship between God and Abraham. In fact, he says, this is the covenant that I established with you. And in the second case, in Jeremiah, it is used as a symbol uh, of the wickedness of Israel, uh, and that by undergoing this rite, symbolically, they are... Uh, they are uh, divorcing themselves from that wickedness. Uh, and so we see that, it ha th that circumcision as a symbol symbolizes something very strong. It symbolizes the salvation of God's people. And yet physical circumcision is explicitly said to not be the substance of salvation under any administration of God's grace. In Romans 4 verse 9, Cometh this blessedness upon, uh, then upon the circumcision only, or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckoned, when he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness which he had, uh, of, of the faith which he had, being yet uncircumcised. So Abraham here was justified... Uh, before he was circumcised. And the implication that the author of Romans draws from this uh, is that, uh, therefore, circumcision is not the substance of salvation. And uh, he goes on in the argument to say that even the uncircumcision, that they can also receive the promise by faith. And so keeping that distinction in mind uh, between the substance of God's promises and the symbol of God's promises of salvation uh, is a very important thing for us when we approach any symbol, including baptism. Uh, my first contention then uh, is that because of the doctrine of sola fide, that is faith alone, that we're justified solely on the basis of faith and the righteousness of Christ, uh, that because of this doctrine, uh, baptism cannot be a means of saving grace. It cannot be necessary for our salvation. I'll just gloss these passages because we looked at them uh, last night in uh, the first part of this debate. Uh, Ephesians 2 verse 8, By grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of the works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Uh, if baptism is a work which God has ordained for his church, that he has set forth in advance for his church to follow in, then it is not the occasion of their being saved. Uh, rather, it uh, is simply uh, something that they've been created unto, that they've been called out of their sin to do these good works, but not in order to receive the forgiveness of sins. In Titus 3 verse 4, But after that the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. It is not by works of righteousness we have done, not by what we have uh, wrought ourselves, but rather it is by his mercy in Jesus Christ in pouring out the Holy Ghost on us and washing us through the Holy Ghost. That's what uh, 
the way by which we're saved, not by works of righteousness. In Romans 4, verse 1, What shall we say then, that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the Scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. To him that worketh not, to Abraham, who did not work for his justification, that faith that we have is reckoned for righteousness to us. And so, a sola fide, the fact that we cannot work for our salvation, uh, is, uh, uh, demonstrates that we are not, uh, that baptism is not necessary for us to receive forgiveness of sins. Uh, second, uh, the origin of baptism as a priestly ordination rite in the Old Testament implies that baptism is a mere symbol. Baptism was derived from Old Testament uh, priestly ordination rites. Exodus 29 verse 4, Aaron and his sons shall br uh, thou shalt bring unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and shalt wash them with water, and thou shalt take the garments and put upon Aaron. Uh, the uh, ordination was that the uh, Aaron and his sons were to be brought to the tabernacle, they were to be given a bath in the laver, uh, and they were to put on their priestly garments. It was this uh, rite in the Old Testament that John the Baptist picks up because, of course, he was the son of a priest. He picks this up in the wilderness and begins to apply it to all Israel because Israel was called to be a kingdom of priests, just as we are in the New Testament. And it is brought into the New Testament church through him. In fact, in Galatians 3.27, we see language that's taken straight from this ordination ritual. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. We have been baptized, that is, we have been washed into Christ, that is, in the name of Christ, so that we may put on the name of Christ and do the work of uh, the priesthood in his body. Uh, it is a ordination rite. And of course, the priests in the Old Testament were still in the covenant people even before their ordination. Uh, it was just that at their baptism, they were fulfilling a vocation that, were, that they were called to. Uh, they were still in the covenant beforehand and afterhand, but the baptism was not uh, for the forgiveness of their sins or for enter entry into the covenant. It was simply so that they could begin the work of serving their God. Third, examples in the book of Acts imply baptism is a mere symbol. And I have two that I, uh, I have here, but I'll just, uh, I'll just focus on one tonight. Acts 10, verse 44 through 48. Uh, the context is that Cornelius, a Gentile man, a God-fearer, uh, that he has called for Peter uh, at the uh, instruction of an angel. He's called for Peter to come into his house and tell him, as it says, words by which he shall be saved. That is, to tell him the gospel. Uh, and so Peter comes and he preaches to uh, him and his household. Uh, the last words that Peter says are that whosoever believes on him uh, shall receive uh, the remission of their sins. And in verse 44, While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? So before they were baptized, they received the mark of a child of God, the indwelling presence of the Spirit, which Jesus Christ prophesied uh, during uh, his ministry after he had uh, risen from the dead. And uh, so the, the, the Holy Ghost comes on to them, 
uh, because they had believed on the words that Peter had said, uh, marking them, sealing them as uh, God's people, uh, the spirit of adoption, as the scripture elsewhere calls it. And then Peter says, who can forbid water that these should not be baptized? After they were converted, then they were baptized. And so we see in this example, a clear example that someone was placed into the body of Christ, that they were recipients of God's saving grace in the Holy Spirit, and yet they had not been baptized yet. My fourth contention is that the thing which baptism symbolizes implies it is a mere symbol. Uh, I'll just uh, explain this really quick. Because baptism symbolizes Jesus Christ, the work that he did, his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension into heaven, therefore the symbol, the, the mere outward show of what Christ does, it is not uh, the thing that we should be focused on. We should see Jesus Christ's own work through that symbol, but not that the symbol is the end of Christ's work. We should see Jesus Christ. Uh, working in it. Uh, a passage that's already uh, uh, been brought up to, to, to uh, try to argue the other side tonight. Romans 6 verse 3. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. And there are two things that I want to put emphasis on. First, is that the end of baptism in this passage is not in order to receive the forgiveness of sins. The end is so that we also should walk in newness of life. That is, in sanctification. That is, in the purpose that Christ has called us to fulfill. In verse 5, though, we see that we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, so that we shall be also in the likeness, and those words are implied, of his resurrection. The uh, uh, purpose of baptism as a symbol is not the substance of what saves us. The substance is Jesus Christ himself. And we shouldn't let baptism get in the way of seeing Christ uh, doing his work for us. In 1 Peter 3 verse 18, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometimes were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. The like figure, whereunto even baptism, doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. We see this um, comment about baptism, that baptism is a figure, that it is situated. Uh, before it comes Christ's death and burial and descent into the grave, and after it comes Christ's uh, 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 resurrection and ascension and seating at the right hand of God. The thing which baptism symbolizes in this passage is Jesus Christ himself, just as in Romans chapter 6, that Jesus died, was buried, rose again, and ascended into heaven. And we should not let the physical act distract us from what it symbolizes, just as the passage says, it is not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. That is, it's not a physical bath, but the answer of a good conscience toward God, the appeal to him that he would forgive sins. And so uh, we should not uh, fall into the very error that Paul himself uh, wished not to fall into. In 1 Corinthians uh, 1 verse 17, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel 
not with words of wi uh, wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ be made of none effect. When we see baptism, we should not see that the act of baptism is what saves. Rather, we should see that Jesus Christ saves, and that by faith in him and his perfect work on the cross for us. Finally, and I'll uh, go very quickly over this, the universal nature of Holy Spirit baptism implies that baptism is a mere symbol. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12, For as the body is one, and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For in one Spirit are we all baptized into one body whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. This passage tells us that spiritual baptism, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, is a universal experience of the body. And of course, this is had through faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, just as Cornelius in his household, uh, and when they received the gift of the Holy Ghost, the baptism in it, uh, that same baptism is ours by faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, it is the substance of what conversion is, that the Holy Spirit works on us to turn us to Christ. Titus 3 verse 5, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. The Holy Ghost is poured out on all of us, and so that we are his. Ezekiel 30, uh, 36 24, For I have will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you and ye shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you. And so with that, I'll just uh, end my time here and I turn it back over to Todd. Thank you all for listening. All right, I'm going to spend the rest of my time here and trying to deal with uh, Tanner's statements in his uh, first speech. First, I want to uh, uh, clarify just a couple things. Um, I don't think Tanner understands our position on baptism. He makes the statement that whether the physical act of baptism or being baptized confers any necessary saving grace. That's not what that's not what we believe at all. That's not what we teach. Uh, we believe that saving faith and obedience to the the conditions that God has set forth is uh, the means of receiving saving grace. And that would include faith in Jesus as commanded by God, repentance of sins as commanded by God, confession of Jesus Christ as Lord as commanded by God, and then submitting to God in the passive act of baptism to receive the remission of our sins. Moreover, I don't know anyone that denies that baptism is a symbol or a likeness or that there is symbolism attached to it. The question is, does symbolism preclude any necessity? In other words, if it's a symbol, does that mean it can't be a necessity if it's a symbol? For example, was, was circumcision a necessity or was it just a symbol? And then he uses the example of, of the priests and the washing of the priests. Well, let me ask a question. Was the washing of the priests a symbol? And if it was, was it necessary? In other words, did one of those, did those Levites have to submit to the washing in order to serve in their place as a priest? And the answer is yes, they did. They have to serve, they had or they had to be washed as it was symbolic, but it was necessary in order to serve in the priesthood. No one ever said, and also no one has ever said that circumcision brings forgiveness, but Jesus said baptism brings forgiveness. Now, he may have likened baptism to circumcision, and Paul likened baptism to circumcision, but that doesn't mean that doesn't mean that there are no attack. There are no conditions or, or no blessings attached to it. And so, you know, no one ever said baptism or excuse me, circumcision brings remission of sins. But Jesus said baptism brings the remission of sins. Jesus said baptism brings salvation. Jesus said baptism 
brings discipleship. I mean, if we're going to dismiss something just simply on the basis of it being a symbol, then I want to ask about the serpent. Was the serpent symbolic of anything? And, and if so, was there, was there no substance to, to their faith because they believed God and obeyed God when they looked at that symbolic thing? And so when we submit to baptism, we are submitting to God. And our faith is not in the act of baptism. Our faith is in God who said, when you are baptized, I will cleanse you of your sins. Uh, I, I thought, you know, the whole book of Revelation is, is based in symbolism. So I guess there's absolutely no substance to the book of revelation whatsoever because it is it is symbolic and those symbols don't mean anything and so but jesus in speaking about uh, or excuse me paul when speaking about baptism he spoke of it as being associated with circumcision he said it's the circumcision of the heart in colossians chapter 2 verses 11 through 13 that it's a circumcision made without hands and moreover that it brings the forgiveness of sins, that we're buried with Christ in baptism, raised through faith in the work of God who raised him from the dead. Baptism is an act of faith. And we believe what God said, that when we submit to that act, that God will keep his promise to wash us from our sins in the blood of Jesus Christ. And then down toward the bottom, uh, or, or, I'm looking at my notes here, uh, when he said sola fide implies baptism is a mere symbol. Now, this is a common fallacy, which is known as begging the question. In other words, he assumes that sola fide is correct, even though he spent all last night trying to prove it and he didn't do it. And so he just argues from sola fide, even though it, it's not been established as being true. In fact, it's false. And so I'm not going to allow him to beg the question and argue uh, from sola fide. That, uh, that sola fide implies baptism is a mere symbol. And so, and so with that, I want to ask the question, and with regard to Ephesians 2, which he quoted, uh, in regard to this argument, how would the Ephesians, how would the Ephesians have understood Paul's statement in Ephesians chapter 2, 8 to 10? And we can simply go to Acts 18 and Acts 19 and answer that question. In Acts 19, Paul came to Ephesus and he found certain disciples and he said, have you received the spirit since you were baptized? Or he says, since you believed, I'm sorry, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? They said, we have not heard whether there be any such thing as a Holy Spirit. He said, unto what then were you baptized? Unto what? He didn't say, have you been baptized? He said, for what purpose were you baptized? What was the authority behind your baptism? They said, unto John's baptism. Paul said, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying that you should believe on him who is to come after that is on Christ. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of Jesus. And so I'll go right back to, uh, to my point earlier. What is baptism in the name of Jesus? It's the baptism that Jesus authorized. It's a baptism that makes one a disciple, Matthew 28, 19. It's a baptism that brings salvation to the one who submits to it, Mark 16. It brings the remission of sins, Luke 24, 47, Acts 2, and 38. It's a baptism that washes away, uh, 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 brings about the washing away of sins, uh, Acts 22, 16. They were baptized in the name of Jesus. Now, Tanner's going to have to explain what baptism in the name of Jesus is because men administered it. Men administered the baptism in the name of Jesus. Then Tanner went to uh, Titus chapter 3 and verse uh, numbers uh, 4, 5, and 6. And he spoke about the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. And yet he didn't define the terms. The word regeneration means new birth. It's the washing of new birth and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. What do we find in Acts 2.38? The washing baptism and the promise of the Holy Spirit. What do we find in, uh, in uh, uh, 1 Peter 2, or excuse me, 1 Peter 1, 22 and, and uh, 23? Seeing then you have purified your souls by obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love for the brethren. See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again. When were they born again? When they obeyed the truth through the spirit. When they obeyed, they were born again. And that's what Jesus taught in John 3, 3 and 5, that, that baptism, uh, that baptism uh, uh, 
and what the washing of water and, and or the, the being born of water and spirit is necessary for entrance into the kingdom of God. Water and spirit, baptism and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, Titus 3 and verse 5, which is the means by which we are justified by God's grace, Titus 3 and verse number 7. And then Tanner keeps bringing up Abraham, and Abraham believed God, and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. But that passage doesn't have anything to do with Abraham being saved. We can go back and look at Genesis 12, 13, and 14 and see repeated instances where Abraham obeyed God, was worshiping God, building altars, altars making sacrifice. And in Genesis 15, 6, it says that Abraham believed God and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. But what Tanner hasn't told you is that James quoted that exact same verse, that exact same passage from Genesis 15, 6. And he said that when Abraham offered Isaac, on the altar then was brought to pass the saying that abraham believed god and it was accounted unto him for righteousness and so that verse in genesis 15 6 is applied to abraham's obedient faith and not to the fact that he did not do anything james is very clear that that it was abraham's obedient faith that brought to fruition brought to pass that text there in genesis 15 and verse number six. Again, Tanner makes mention of, of the, the priesthood and the ordinance of washing. But again, it was a necessity. It was required. It was symbolic. And yet it was required. And then I have no reason understanding why he mentioned Galatians 3.27. Because that passage says we are baptized into Christ. In verse 26, it says, for as many of you as uh, 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 that you are all the sons of God, by the faith which is in Christ Jesus. For, this is an explanation, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. We're made the sons of God through faith when we are baptized into Christ. And then, and then he makes mention of John's baptism being borrowed from the proselyte baptism. Now, what he's going to have to do is show me one single verse from the Old Testament that shows proselyte baptism. In fact, there is no evidence that proselyte baptism was even practiced before John and Jesus came on the scene. Andreas uh, Kostenberger in the book Believer's Baptism makes the note and also quotes McKnight that says there is no pre-Christian evidence of proselyte baptism, none. And so did John really borrow something from the Jews? And then, then Tanner goes on and says, and Jesus borrowed it from him and brought it into the New Testament. I'm gonna ask Tanner this question. The baptism of John, where did it come from? God or man? That's the question Jesus asked those in, in Matthew 21 and verse 24, when, when they would claim to be Ma the masters of authority, the baptism of John, where did it come from? Heaven or man? And they would not answer because they knew it came from heaven. John did not borrow that baptism. He even said himself that God sent him to baptize in John chapter one and verse number 24. God sent John to baptize and Jesus was ob obligated to, to obey that baptism to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus wasn't obeying something that John borrowed from so-called proselyte baptism? Tanner, answer me that question. John's baptism from heaven or from men? Uh, the, the testimony of the text and, and, and the scholarship of, of, of others says that, uh, that there was no such thing as proselyte baptism before, uh, before this. Then Tanner goes to Acts 10, 44 to 48. And again, what he fails, what he fails to note is verse 48. That after this incident, uh, the account of Peter preaching to the Gentiles and the Holy Spirit fell on them. And P as Peter described, as it did on us at the beginning. In other words, whatever happened to Peter and the apostles in Acts 2 is the exact same thing that happened in Acts 10. He, he described it in such language in Acts 11 and in Acts 15. And so. After the Holy Spirit fell as a sign to Peter that the Gentiles were the recipients of the gospel of the gospel dispensation, it says he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus. Again, which baptism is that? 
the baptism of Jesus. What baptism is that? The baptism that brings discipleship. The baptism that brings salvation, Mark 16. The baptism that brings remission of sins, Luke 24 and Acts 2 and verse 38. Tanner says they were converted before they were baptized. If that be the case, they were converted before they were baptized by the authority of Jesus Christ. And that just that just simply will not hold any water. And then lastly, he spoke about the universal nature of Holy Spirit baptism. So I'm going to ask him, does what happens today, is what happened to Tanner when he received the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Is it like what happened in Acts 2, 1 to 4? Tanner, did you speak in tongues? Did you speak in a language that you had never studied before and, 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 and preach to people in a language you'd never studied before? Did, did you do like the Gentiles when they were baptized in the Holy Spirit in, in Acts 10? And, and, and they began to speak in other tongues and glorify God? If, the, if there's a universal nature of Holy Spirit baptism, then whatever happened in Acts 2 and whatever happened in Acts 10, which are the same thing, has to happen today. And you know that is not true. And so with that, uh, I believe I've answered most of his arguments and my time is almost gone. So I will uh, turn it back over to Ben at this time. All right. Uh, well, I just uh, thank Todd once again for uh, his interaction that he has uh, given so far. And uh, I'll just jump right into uh, a little rebuttal here. Uh, the first thing I wanted to address is that uh, Todd seems to to make a conflation between law and grace in his uh, in his slides that he has. Uh, he has that grace is given in order that a person can obey law. And I would just like to ask him whether or not uh, that would apply for the Old Testament law of Moses then. If grace is only given as a means to be able to serve a law, then why is uh, why is it that we cannot be justified by the Old Testament law? Uh, is there not a grace that God could give that would cause us to to be able to serve His law? Uh, and as far as the Old Testament, and uh, if that's the 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 case, then well, why is it that we are justified by uh, the obedience of Christ to the Old Testament law? Uh, it just seems to be a conflation. Uh, Galatians three verse twelve says that the law is not of faith that the law of the Old Testament and faith uh, are opposed to one another. Uh, if grace is the only thing that makes faith um, uh, different or, or, or that, that, that makes obedience uh, to the law according to faith, well then that's what the first century Jews believed. They believed in the necessity of grace in order to serve the law. Uh, but we know that that the justification is not by the law. I mean, we both agree to that, and, and we know that. But um, it, it just seems that he makes a little bit of a conflation concerning the law and grace in that uh, that case. Um, second, I'll just say that, that we talked about uh, the use of analogies in the Old Testament last night. Uh, he brought up analogies concerning uh, the uh, serpent that was lifted up in the wilderness, concerning... Uh, the wall of Jericho he brought up concerning various healings that Christ did and that uh, Elisha did in the Old Testament. And, uh, you know, that's all fine and good. And, and where they comport with New Testament uh, 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 or where, where the interpretation of those comports with New Testament uh, understandings of the gospel, that's, that's perfectly fine. But where we get off the rails is where we start to, to use them uh, as uh, a, a means to understand the gospel in its entirety, uh, that, that, that in every way that this is how men are saved. That, and if that's the case, I, I want to see where it is that uh, Todd is looking to the brazen serpent. Where is it that he's going and washing in the Jordan River specifically? Uh, are there not all these other rivers? Uh, why is he not going to Jordan? Uh, I know that we there is a proper use of analogy, but it can be taken too far. And I believe that that's what uh, Todd has been doing tonight in our debate. Uh, he brought up Mark 16, 16, uh, and I'll just say that a lot of the passages he brought up are, are no trouble to me. Uh, Mark 16 mentions repentance. Repentance is the uh, negative side of faith. That is turning away from self and self-reliance and self-love 
to turn and look in faith and trust and love toward Jesus Christ. And as long as, as that is maintained, there's nothing wrong with saying, he that, believe, uh, that, uh, uh, he that believeth and is baptized uh, shall be saved. Or in Acts 2.38, uh, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus for the remission of your sins. Uh, there's nothing against sola fide in this. As long as faith is incorporated, uh, then a person is saved. That is genuine faith. Uh, but the question is, are they saved by virtue of the faith or by virtue of the obedience? And I would say that they are saved by virtue of the faith. Uh, that as soon as they place faith in Christ, that is when they are saved, and then they obey him. Uh, there, there is nothing uh, in that to contradict what I've uh, been saying. Uh, again, in, in Acts 2.38, um, I'll bring up an objection that he uh, somewhat preempted, uh, the word is there, that is for, that is before the rem uh, for the remission of your sins there. Uh, that word can mean uh, because of instead of for the purpose of. Uh, and this is uh, found in places like Luke 11.32, where Jesus says that they, the, uh, that the city of Nineveh repented at Is, the preaching of Jonah. There is a use of the word Is where the, uh, the people repented because of the preaching of Jonah, not the other way around. And it may simply be the same here, and we'll have to look elsewhere in the scripture to determine which reading we ought to bring. Uh, he looked to, uh, Acts, uh, to Romans uh, chapter 10, and he noted a uh, a parallel between calling on the name of the Lord and obeying the gospel. And uh, this does, again, does not uh, say anything against my position. As long as obeying the gospel simply means having trust in Jesus Christ, looking to him in faith, then that is perfectly acceptable. Uh, he went to Romans 6 uh, and verse 3. Uh, once again, and uh, I just like to to note once again uh, that you know uh, the the language that's used here is is patently symbolic uh, that it is in the likeness of uh, that we are we are planted together in the likeness of his death that we may be in the likeness of his resurrection. Justification is not mentioned here. Uh, the the point of the passage, the aim of the passage, is that we should walk in newness of life. That is, walk consistently with the thing, the the uh, the symbol that we have declared faith in Christ by. Uh, we have been baptized again. Yes, in the authority of Christ. Christ commands to baptize. That's perfectly fine. Uh, and by that act of baptism, we have been in the likeness. Of his death, the image of his death. Uh, he brought up uh, verses 17 and 18, and again, I'll just say that uh, there's no necessary causal link in that passage, and even if there is, the context is sanctification, that is, service to Christ. Uh, now, I have about eight minutes here, and uh, I'd like to address a few things that Todd said in his rebuttal. You're on. All right. Well, uh, everybody, we uh, had a little hiccup there. Um, we, we just uh, dropped out of the stream for a, a moment, and uh, so I'm going to backtrack just a little bit about where I think uh, the stream uh, 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 cut off, and uh, we'll just uh, move forward from there. Uh, and so, uh, just with that, um, I believe the last thing that uh, I was saying before it cut off was that baptism is a passive act. Todd uh, made this claim uh, and, and made this claim that it, it means that baptism is uh, not meritorious in any way. And I, I just asked uh, whether he thinks that circumcision was the same way, because circumcision also was a passive act. Uh, it was usually done in infancy, and even when it was done in adulthood, uh, we, we don't see anybody circumcising themselves uh, under the Old Testament. Uh, and so uh, it was a passive act, and that does not mean that it was therefore not meritorious. Submission to circumcision or submission to baptism, we cannot make the judgment based on the passivity of the act. Uh, next, he, he made the claim, or he, he made the statement that I brought up a proselyte baptism. 
uh, that John's baptism was borrowed from proselyte baptism among the Jews. And I never made this claim at all. Uh, I said that John uh, was taking the Old Testament priestly rite of uh, baptism, uh, which is uh, spoken of uh, in uh, Exodus 29, verse 4. So in answer to his question, where, what is baptism? Uh, where did it come from? Where was John's baptism from? Of men or of God? I say of God. It came from the Old Testament. God led John to begin to baptize as a priestly rite the nation of Israel. And then that same rite, Jesus Christ, also took up the mantle as John decreased, Christ increased in the context of baptism in John chapter 3. That's what it's talking about, that Jesus began to baptize. He took up the mantle of the same baptism, the same priestly rite, and began to baptize in his name. And so uh, that is what uh, the purpose that baptism served. Uh, we also see in the Old Testament that this priestly rite was not necessary for individual salvation. A priest may very well, a, a Levite may very well have been saved and never been ordained as a priest. Uh, he would just be among the general congregation of Israel, and he would just look to the uh, the um, the image of the sacrifice, the image of Jesus Christ, in faith toward God, and he would be saved. Uh, he mentions that uh, that I am saying that 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 if it is a symbol, that it is not important. That's absolutely not what I'm saying. I'm saying that that I'm saying that the symbol is important because of what it symbolizes, but not because it confers the grace of the thing that it symbolizes. Uh, it is important. Jesus said that we should baptize. He, he, he said, as, as Todd uh, mentioned in uh, Matthew 28, uh, 19 through 20, um, that we should go and, and teach all nations, uh, disciple them, baptize them. This is by the command of Christ. But it is a symbol, and it should be treated as such. We should rather emphasize Jesus Christ himself rather than the baptism. We should use baptism as a way of uh, remembering Christ, as a way of knowing what he has done for us, but not as the substance of what he's done for us. Uh, he mentioned that in bringing up sola fide that I am begging the question. Anyone can go back and see that I provided arguments. I did not beg the question, and he has not dealt with all those arguments. Uh, he mentioned that uh, uh, Ephesians chapter 2, uh, the context in which it should be understood is in Acts 19. And well and good, that's, that's fine. Uh, the Ephesians would have understood that Acts 19, the emphasis of it is faith. Uh, because what he was uh, concerned about is that after they were baptized, whether they had believed. He said bapt the baptism of John was so that you would believe in him that came after, that is Jesus Christ. That's what uh, what was on Paul's mind when he was there with them. Uh, we also see that in the chapter before, uh, that Apollos came in the Spirit, in the Holy Spirit, and he taught mightily and persuaded the Jews the things of the Lord, that is, the things of Christ. And he, uh, and he, uh, so we see that he was, um, he was he was saved even though he had only had the baptism of John because he believed on Jesus and so uh, you know, there we have that uh, he goes to Titus chapter 3 the passage that I brought up uh, that that uh, not by works of righteousness which we have done but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. I'd like to mention first that it is through Jesus Christ, again, the substance of the symbol, that he does this. And I'd also like to notice, uh, I'd like us to notice that the thing by which we are washed, the thing by which we are regenerated, the thing which is poured out on us in the passage is the Holy Ghost itself. This is the act of God in the Holy Ghost, just as in the book of Acts. And this is universal to the body. This is what happened in Acts chapter 10 in Cornelius' house after they believed, but before they were physically baptized. And so uh, I don't see any, um, uh, anything there that contradicts uh, what I've been uh, saying. Uh, he 
brought up Romans 4, uh, and he said that Romans 4 is not about Abraham's salvation. And I don't, I'm not really sure... I'm not really sure how to take this, to be to be honest. It says that he was justified, uh, that 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 he that he was justified. I mean, th this is the the gospel that's being laid out. I don't know what Todd meant. Maybe he misspoke, and I'll I'll give him uh, the benefit of the doubt on this one. But I don't think that we want to say that Romans four is not about. Abraham's salvation. It's it's patently about his salvation, how he was declared righteous before God. Uh, he mentioned uh, James 2, and I think uh, since my time is, is running out somewhat, I think I'd like to go to James 2 and, and really see what James 2 is saying. Uh, I did this in uh, our last debate that we had, and I'd like to do it here also. Uh, James chapter 2, the, the, the point of James chapter 2 is that we demonstrate our faith, that we have faith by doing, by uh, obeying, uh, but not that we are, we are made righteous by our doing. Uh, the, verse 14 says, a man may say he ha uh, hath faith and have no works. Uh, can that faith save him? In verse 16, one of you say unto them. In verse 18, Yea, a man may say, and uh, thou hast faith, I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works. I will show thee my faith by my works. It's about uh, a claim to faith and demonstrating the veracity of that claim to faith. Uh, he brings up verse 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac uh, his son upon the altar? Uh, if he wants to... Uh, uh, say that uh, Romans 4 is not about uh, Abraham's salvation, then this is not about his salvation either. And uh, we, you know, we, uh, we cannot uh, uh, make the, the uh, divorce uh, uh, about the, the way that this passage is going to be uh, quoted. Was not Abraham our father justified by works? Uh, how is James using the word justified here? Is he using it in the sense of being declared righteous before God, or in the sense of being vindicated, as in Matthew 11, verse 19, where uh, wisdom is justified of her children? When he had offered Isaac, uh, his son, upon the altar, 22, seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Uh, this is from Second Corinthians, that he was called the friend of God, and this is the point, that we would be called the friend of God before the world. And I'd just like to thank you. That's the end of my time. All right. To make my final statement, I want to thank David and Ben again for the invitation to be a part of this discussion and for their work in bringing it to fruition. I want to thank Tanner again for his agreement to participate in the fine way that he's conducted himself through this course of this exchange. Again, thanks to all who are watching now, who will, will watch in the future. And also, again, thanks to God for this opportunity. Uh, debates are generally much longer than what we're doing tonight. Uh, there's generally a lot more time in the affirmatives and negatives. There's more affirmatives and negatives. There's more nights. There's like two nights for each affirmative. And so time's not going to allow me to address all of Tanner's statements because my closing arguments are or my closing statement is five minutes. And so just like he didn't have time in 15 to deal with all of my statements, and, and you can tell we're trying to rush through and, and, and do our best to address each one's arguments. But uh, it's not going to be possible for me to answer all the things in my five minutes that he answered or said in his last 15. But I'd be happy to address any questions that you might have in writing and uh, post them to my Facebook page or uh, to even to, to Preacher Feature. And, uh, and if you have any questions, I'll be happy to address those. The one thing I will address that, ta that uh, Tanner brought up in his last was the word ace in uh, Acts 2 and verse 38. Uh, I said it looks forward. He said it can look backward. Uh, there are 1,750 or 1,751 usages of ace in uh, the New Testament. And uh, they none of them look backward, not even the one that he cited in Matthew 12, 41. It looks forward to the life that Jonah demanded of the Ninevites. 
the, the Greek language had a preposition that looked backward, and that is the word dia. In Mark 15 and verse 10, the Bible says that Pilate knew that for or because of envy, they had delivered up Jesus. There was a preposition to look backward. It is the word dia. It is not the word ace. Moreover, Jesus said his blood was shed, ace the remission of sins in Matthew 26, 28, unto the remission of sins, for the remission of sins. So it's the exact same construction in Matthew 26 as it is next two. And so whatever, whatever it says in Matthew 26 is what it means in Acts 2. But as I close, let me just ask you to, to walk with me just for a moment. Imagine that you were standing next to Jesus in Mark, Mark 16, 15 and 16, and you heard him say, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. What would you think about the necessity of baptism as a condition of salvation? Imagine that you were in the audience with Peter and the, on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter two, and you heard Peter say in response to the question, men and brethren, what shall we do? You heard Peter say, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. What would you think about the necessity of baptism to receive the remission of sins? We know what some of them thought about 3,000 gladly received his word and they were baptized. Imagine you were in the room with Saul of Tarsus when Ananias said to him, and now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. What would you think about the necessity of baptism with regard to the washing away of sins? All these quibbles that Tanner wants to make about this language does not overcome the force of the statements themselves. As we think about this debate, what Tanner has not proven, he has not proven that man is totally depraved and thus totally unable to respond to God's offer of salvation. He's not provided proof that God's sovereignty precludes conditions of blessing. He has not proved that any response of man adds to the power of God. He has not provided any proof that baptism has no bearing on the remission of sins. But what I've established in this debate, particularly tonight, that God, God attaches conditions to the receipt of his blessings, that obedience to God's commands in no way adds to his blessings or his work, and that God has attached conditions to receiving the remission of sins, namely faith in Jesus Christ, repentance of sin, confession, and immersion in water to receive the remission of sins. I believe Tanner is a conscientious and sincere man. I believe that he truly desires to serve God and wants others to do so. But what he is teaching, we have shown, is not what the Bible teaches about salvation. The one thing I've prayed for in preparation and throughout this debate is that those who have not obeyed God and his word will obey him and be saved. I will continue to pray for that after this discussion is over. And with that, I'll close. All right. Well, uh, just again, I'd like to uh, thank Brother uh, Todd uh, tonight and uh, Brother Ben for putting this on. Uh, just as uh, Todd, uh, you know, uh, gave a, a good word about me, I'd like to give a good word about him. Uh, he's been kind throughout this uh, whole thing. He's been very patient with uh, uh, my uh, peculiarities, and uh, I'm I'm very thankful for that. That uh, that, that he's been uh, so kind, and and hopefully uh, I've been uh, kind in turn toward him. Uh, I'd just like to uh, end tonight uh, just a, a couple of, of uh, things that I wanted to address that, that uh, Todd mentioned uh, that I didn't get a, a chance to address before uh, or that, that I didn't uh, that I'll have a, a time to address now um, is that uh, Luke 11 uh, verse 32 uh, does not um, it is a, a good parallel in the its grammar to uh, Acts 2 38. Uh, for they repented at the preaching of Jonas. Uh, if we're going to say that they uh, that they repented in order to receive the preaching of Jonas, well, that's that's uh, you know one thing, but uh, that's not quite how the passage flows. Um, I think that even though it's an uncommon use, uh, nonetheless, it warrants investigation if the scripture has uh, taught us, as I've demonstrated tonight, that justification is by faith alone. Uh, and so uh, with that, uh, I would just like to uh, 
uh, bring us to a passage of scripture in closing. Uh, much li like I did with Matt before, I'd like us to uh, look at uh, Romans chapter 4 and verse 1. What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Uh, here what we have in the scripture uh, is a, a beautiful statement uh, that we are not justified by our own doing, by our own uh, effort that we put forward. Uh, that Abraham was not justified in this way. Uh, that no one throughout history uh, has been justified uh, through uh, their working, uh, through their own effort. Uh, Abraham uh, was justified uh, simply by faith, simply because he trusted, uh, trusted in God. Now later he was uh, demonstrated, uh, he demonstrated before the world that he had faith when he offered Isaac up, and so he was called the friend of God by the world, uh, but he was justified before God by the simple act of faith that he had. And uh, I, uh, we see it plainly in the scripture. Uh, and so, uh, you know, uh, with that, uh, I'd just like to, uh, you know, end off here. Uh, once again, just thank you all for listening. Uh, I hope that everybody, and I, I have faith that everybody who uh, has the uh, uh, interest in this and, and the drive to come and uh, listen for two nights in a, ro a row, nearly, uh, I'm going to guess about uh, four hours of uh, discussion between uh, two people over the internet, one of whom you're uh, unable to see right now, uh, that uh, you'll go home. Uh, I have faith that you'll go home or go into your room uh, and you'll study through what's been discussed tonight. You're likely taking notes. Uh, you're uh, likely preparing and, and uh, you know what you're going to look at first. Uh, and I just want to admonish you all uh, to go to the scripture, see what it says, uh, and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, him alone. And uh, I just uh, once again thank you all for tonight. Uh, and with that, uh, I'll just cede the rest of my time uh, to your enjoyment this evening. God bless. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed the debate. I know, I know that I did. Hopefully, uh, in watching this, you, you see the the need. Uh, the interest, the desire for things like this to continue. Uh, we want to we want to make sure that everyone watching uh, knows that this is a this is a platform to to share these different stances on doctrinal issues, um, and and we would like to we'd like to feature really anybody who would be interested uh, in in presenting what they believe and then and then letting it be. Uh, attacked. So we want to thank Tanner so much for coming on here and, and thank Todd so much. I know they prepared a lot. I'm sure you guys could see that. Um, but we want to thank you guys for tuning in as well. We hope you have a good night, have a good weekend, and we'll see you next time.